right, good evening everyone. We are going to get started up here. There is a lot to see and do, excuse me, move that, um, in the garden tonight, so we'll, we'll get started. And people, feel free to um, come on over whenever you grab your food or drinks. And welcome to the kickoff 2014 season of Food in the Garden. Getting a little wind blown here. So I'm, I'm Susan Evans. I'm the program director of the American Food History Project here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And I am thrilled to be sitting here in this beautiful Victory Garden um, that was created by Smithsonian Gardens, who are our partner in this endeavor. And you'll see that it is full of heirloom crops that really help connect us to our food heritage and American history right here in the beautiful outdoors. And so welcome back. We did this last year and it was our first year. We're, we're trying it again. And how many of you were with us last summer? Any of you? Oh, thank you. Repeats. We love that. And welcome to those of you that this is your first as well. So this year at Food in the Garden, we are actually looking at the history and legacy of the War of 1812. 2014 is the 200th anniversary of the writing of the Star Spangled Banner after the Battle of Baltimore during the War of 1812. It's a long-winded anniversary, but an important one to us because we here are the home of the Star Spangled Banner. So the actual flag that Francis Scott Key was looking at when he wrote the lyrics to what later became our national anthem. So at Food in the Garden this year, we are looking at four waterways impacted by the War of 1812 the Long Island Sound this week, the Chesapeake Bay next week, the Great Lakes the week after, and we'll wrap up at the end of August looking at the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll, we'll be looking at the impact of the war on the foods of those important regions and asking big questions about what is happening in those regions today around foodways and waterways. So we hope that you will join us every Thursday of this month. Food in the Garden is one of the many programs that we do around food and food history here at the museum. And starting next summer, the museum will actually have a demonstration kitchen inside the building as well. So there'll be much more going on and we hope you'll come back and also give us your feedback on these programs and let us know if you have any ideas for things that you would like to see. And of course, it is socially acceptable to have your phones out because you'll all be tweeting using the hashtag <laughs> food in the garden, telling all your friends what a good time you're having tonight. <laughs> and, <thank> you. <laughs> and if you need to get a refill on drinks or get up and walk around, this is a really relaxed evening in the garden, so feel free to get up. And there'll be plenty of time after the panel to talk with the panelists and enjoy the garden. Um, we know we're not going to cover 200 years of history on this panel tonight. We're ambitious, but we're not that ambitious. Um, so I encourage you to continue the conversation out in the garden. So before we get started, I want to give a special thank you to our generous supporters who made this evening possible. We'd like to thank the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts and DuPont Pioneer. We're lucky enough to have some people from DuPont Pioneer here with us tonight. Michelle Gowdy and Steve Betts are with us. And they are great partners who have supported our efforts to have conversations about how Americans understand themselves through our shared food history. I also want to thank our in-kind donors who are bringing you the food that's on your plate and the drinks that you are drinking. You are drinking cocktails made with DC's own Green Hat Gin from New Columbia Distillers and also uh, cider from Distillery Lane Cider Works. Tim Rose of Distillery Lane Cider Works is uh, also actually a geologist at the Natural History Museum. So he's a very talented guy and we're thrilled to have him with us. And we'd like to thank uh, the Wegmans for providing us with the food that you're eating as well. And of course, our chef, William Bednar, for the um, most delicious meals you could imagine, all themed around what we're talking about tonight. And as you might imagine, it takes a large team to make all of this possible in this beautiful garden. So we'd like to thank all of our Smithsonian Gardens colleagues and American History staff who have worked to pull this all together. So let's get started. Um, Long Island Sound is one of the most historic estuaries in the country. And in 1812, it was a crossroads of trade and agriculture. Seeds from around the globe were brought to its shores and ships moved goods out into other regions of the world. There was a dynamic interplay between rural regions and cities. The area was and continues to be renowned for its uh, incredible abundance, both in produce and wine and fishing. And the Long Island Sound Basin, which stretches from New York to Vermont to New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, 
is actually home to about 8 million people. But what has been the human impact on that great body of water since the War of 1812? And what are the farmers and fishers doing in that region today? So to help us answer all those questions, we have to my left Cindy Lobel, who is an assistant professor of history at Lehman College in New York and the author of the recent, and may I add riveting, book, <laughs> uh, Urban Appetites, Food and Culture in 19th Century New York. To her left is Stephanie Villani, who is the co-owner of Blue Moon Fish in Mattituck, Long Island. Stephanie and Blue Moon Fish have been selling their catch to consumers directly in New York City since 1996 at farmer's markets. And Diana Whipsit, to her left, is a Terry of Terry Farms, a farm that has been in operation on Long Island for over 300 years. Terry Farms sells directly to consumers through farmer's markets and is part of the family farm who created the Long Island Growers Market. So, Cindy, will you help situate us in the War of 1812? So in the 19th century at this time, what was being produced by farms and caught by fishermen in the region? Right, so can everyone hear me? I was told for the first time in my life that I was not being loud enough. <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, I mean, I'll situate us in the early national period. Um, you know, when I teach U.S. history, which I do all the time, it, the War of 1812 gets very short shrift. <laughs> uh, but the early national period um, and the period uh, around the War of 1812 um, really continues a century plus long history of a very symbiotic relationship between the Long Island Sound area and New York City, which is really the focus of, of, of my research and of my scholarship. Um, New York City is a city that, uh, from the very beginning, is not populated by farmers. <laughs> it's populated by traders, and so they depend on the hinterlands and the region in order to provide the markets of New York. And Long Island and Connecticut and Westchester and the areas around the Long Island Sound are really crucial in terms of providing that uh, the bounty that comes into the New York City markets, and frankly, more bountiful than what is available today. Um, Sometimes people find that surprising that in the 19th century there's actually more variety of foods that are able to be grown because um, uh, pop pollution and, and environmental issues have really, uh, uh, um, and industrial farming, et cetera, have really limited uh, what is actually available to be grown. Um, and so when we get into that era, into the early national era, we have um, these farms that have been actually turned over to commercial production and the fisheries as well turned over to commercial production for over a hundred years. So it's not this little, uh, what sometimes people think of this kind of like self-sufficient self uh, houses and farms that, you know, really are, are, are uh, oriented toward a very small community. They're actually oriented toward a very large community um, of New York City and then the world beyond New York City because from a, rel a relatively early point, New York City is exporting out. One of the things that the War of 1812 does is it actually stops a lot of those exports. And so um, that blockade that happens along the Long Island Sound makes it so that the farmers are more turning inward and really concentrating more on uh, better transportation networks and technology that will allow them to really cultivate the domestic markets because the international markets are really uh, limited during that period of time, at least for this area, not so much for New England, which is actually shipping out <laughs> uh, even during the War of 1812. And so the War of 1812 is actually a very crucial period in terms of what comes afterwards for the production of foodstuffs uh, in that area because um, those ser that's, that search for technology and for transportation development means that you have very intensive agriculture that is developing and will really lead to these very significant changes that happen over the course of the 19th century in terms of uh, what people are eating, how they're getting it, how it's getting to market, how it's being sold. And that really is um, very much rooted in that blockade and in the, the need to find more local markets when the markets... Um, uh, abroad are, are shut off. Closed off. And That's right. Diana, your, um, far your family's farm was one of those farms on eastern Long Island producing and existing in the 1812 era. And I know you were saying there are some very uh, fascinating stories about that side of Long Island during the War of 1812. Well, the eastern end of Long Island, South Old Town, is a, Long Island is, looks like a fish and we're way out at the end. Um, before the War of 1812, we used coastal schooners to take our produce into New York City, as Cindy said, but also to Boston because we're, we're equidistant between the two. Um, off the tip of my town is an island 800 acres called 
Plum Island. And it was the headquarters of the British Naval Fleet. So here they come in, and our Navy in Long Island Sound, or our schooners, took one look at the large frigates and galleons that they had and scooted right up the Thames River in Connecticut. <laughs> the British tried to follow us in to decimate our fleet, and one little ship made it in, and then a galleon grounded itself, they did not know our waters, on Galleon Rock, which is still called Galleon Rock to this day. What is unique about where we live is during the Revolutionary War, um, Eastern Long Island was devastated by the British. Um, everyone had to flee to Connecticut, leaving their farms behind if they did not sign an oath of loyalty to the king. Most families would designate one member of the family to sign the oath to stay behind to try to protect the livestock. Um, but it was devastated. So 40 years later, you come to the 1812 war, there is still a generation of local people alive who remember that and don't want it again. So basically, we traded with the enemy. They were right off the island of Plum Island. We had no, really no choice. They came and they took 12 oxen. They took the, the produce. They took everything. And we just dealt with it. We were being paid. We have a letter in our historian's book. His name is Augustus Griffin that said, as soon as we get, it was a letter from Admiral Hardy who was in charge of us, the, Brit the Brit British Admiral. As soon as we get some money from Halifax or Bermuda, we will pay you for the oxen that we have taken from you. <laughs> and this was Terry Farms mm -hmm. that was trading with the British. Yes, during we, the were war there, we were there as, as well. We as won't others. tell anyone. It's as fine. well as Your others. Your secret's safe with us. As well as others. <laughs> Except for the um, <laughs> whoever's tweeting it. <laughs> <laughs> Tweet <So> away. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we were trading with them, and we did some fishing, and we got permits from. Admiral Hardy to fish in the local waters, and the letter is in existence this day, to this day, says, if you don't disturb us or distress our ships. Well, one of us, we had torpedo ships. They were little low, not torpedoes, but they're little low ships that couldn't be seen from a distance. And we'd go out and we'd attach, this is more the up, upper end of Long Island, but we, we did it, attach a torpedo to the ship a string and then pull coat, go back into safety and then set off the bomb. Well, one of our little fishermen in his smack did that. And he was arrested, impressed into, put on jail in, in Plum Island. And we got a letter from Admiral Hardy saying, do it again and I'll burn the town down. <laughs> Pretty severe so, so we were trading, but we were trading because we were afraid. So that's what was happening in that Orient in those days. So what does Terry Farms um, grow today? And are they still fishing out there as we're well? We're not the fishermen. <laughs> Stephanie's <laughs> the fishermen. Uh, we were never fishermen. The rackets were the fishermen. Um, but you did whatever you had to do in those days mm -hmm. to make a living. Um, what you sold in the Boston markets and the New York markets, which was whatever you had a good crop of, corn, tomatoes, potatoes, whatever you had. And there was a lot of cordage. New York needed wood to heat to fuel their buildings, oh, and course. so did Boston. So that we were Long Island at that time was a white oak forest, and mm -hmm. now you'll see it's it's barren of any tree. So, huh, interesting. And Stephanie, so you are talking about the modern story that we are touching on this evening, and you can you say a little about your um, family business and how that works, and your relationship with New York City today? I mean, we've heard the the trading that happened in the War of 1812, and there's there's trading happening today between. Um, Long Island and New York City. Um, well, my husband owns a fishing boat. Can you hear me? In um, out of Manitouk Inlet, in eastern Long Island, and we sell. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you're good. Uh, what's in season now is fluke, striped bass, bluefish, squid, porgies. We bring in the local catch, and what we have done is find sort of a niche market. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We drive into New York City and started selling at the farmer's markets. Um, and it, it, it's been tough for people to find fresh fish. Mm -hmm. It's been tough to find a fisherman you can ask questions of, what is this fish? How do I cook it? How is it caught? We can answer all those questions. Um, and we're kind of equivalent to the, the small family farms. Uh, the green market program has been really wonderful for us because it's, it's tough to make a living as a mm -hmm. fisherman or as a farmer. Um, and it's really helped us to do well. 
Yeah. And Cindy, can you talk a little about the, you know, is, are the markets that we imagine today, we've all been to farmer's markets. I don't want to assume that. We, there are lots more <laughs> farmers markets than there were before. How are the markets from today different from the ones around that time period? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. Um, this, this is a very interesting time to study this, this, the history of, of markets <laughs> and of foodways, um, which is, of course, uh, uh, makes perfect sense. I mean, my interest in, the, in it was sort of sparked <laughs> by the fact that there is a kind of resurgence of um, interest in uh, local food and organic food and people knowing where their food is coming from and having a personal relationship with uh, the people who catch and grow their food. And that, um, in many ways, that movement is really a kind of hearkening back to uh, the beginning of the 19th century. So um, for in New York City, for example, and New York City was pretty typical of other New York City is not typical of other cities, of course, at all. But uh, in terms of this, in terms of its uh, public market system, was pretty typical of American cities in that uh, the public market system was the only show in town in the 19th century and in the 18th century as well for where people could get fresh food. The markets were very highly regulated. Market fees actually paid the mayor's salary in New York. So the government had a vested interest in actually keeping the markets going in the early national period. And... Um, that's where all the fresh produce in New York City was sold, and again, other cities as well. That's where fresh meat was sold, um, and, uh, and fish, and dairy, and, uh, and wild game. The hunters would bring the wild game in, and the vendors themselves, just like, uh, like we're having today, um, like Stephanie is describing, the vendors themselves would come in. In New York, they were called the country people who came from <laughs> Long Island or New Jersey or Westchester. Are you still called that today, Stephanie? Uh, no. <laughs> <You> the country <laughs> people. <laughs> <laughs> they would come and they would sell their goods in the markets. And uh, what happens in the 19th century is because of these transportation developments and because of these technological developments, that distance grows between the producer and consumer so that we have the situation that we have by the 20th century of you know, large supermarkets and packaged foods and all the stuff that, say, Michael Pollan and the food reformers today are talking about. So a lot of what we're doing today is kind of trying to turn the clock back a little bit to how it was before these industrial processes really changed the way that we get our food and how it's prepared. And I think it's really interesting that there's um, an idea, you even talked about at the beginning, that there's, um, there's always been commercial farming and fishing. It's taken different shapes over the course of history, and that's just a fascinating thing about American history, that they're, you know, commercial, the definition of commercial has changed Absolutely. over time. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it's not only about food. I mean, that relationship went back and forth. So I, you know, I started out studying food, but at the very last thing I was studying before the book was published was manure, right? It was the, you know, the end of that chain because <laughs> they're actually, the, the Long Island farmers are sending the manure into New York City. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the, the New York City is sending the waste out. Um, and it's being hmm. used as fertilizer That's for, really um, yeah, for the, the farms. So it's that whole sort of chain is, all, is going That's on. That's really interesting. So you um, mentioned that there were some regulations and rules involved. And can... <laughs> I saw Diana's eyes widen when I said <laughs> rules and regulations. So that's something that existed in the 19th century around the market system. Um, what kind of rules and regulations are there today that impact the, f the market system that both Terry Farms and um, Stephanie, you experience? Um, well, there's a lot of regulations on the fishermen. Mm -hmm. the, um, uh, United American fishermen are the most regulated, I understand, in the world. Uh, we have the federal government, we have the State Department of Environmental Con Conservation. Um, they're out there checking. Um, we need to have a license for each different kind of fish. Huh. Each different kind of fish has a different season. You're allowed a different limit on each type of fish. You have to file trip reports each day of what you catch, uh, how much you catch, how much you discard, uh, where it goes to. Um, then we have the local level, the local government mm -hmm. as well. Um, so there's a lot of regulations people don't see. Um, yeah. Part of my job, I find, is teaching people um, about them. Like, uh, sea bass is closed. I can't, I don't have it today. You know, but you had it last week, but they've closed it for a few months. You know, I mm -hmm. won't have it. And that's hard to get people used to, huh. um, since they're used to getting what they want mm -hmm. anytime. And so I've had to teach them that they're, they're seasonal fishes. Mm -hmm that they have to learn about. Huh, that's really interesting. And much like Diana said, when there was, a, there was seasonal growing in, at your family farm in 1812, is that something that Terry Farms is also kind of has to train the audience for in a way? 
Well, now we have um, a, a niche <coughs> program as well. We grow designer vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is a design? Can you tell us what a designer vegetable is? We grow is? every kind of heirloom <laughs> tomato you would ever hope to buy, to want, and purple cauliflower and red cauliflower and basil and flavored basils, and we have 50 different crops that we grow. It's primarily things that people can't buy in the supermarket. Hmm. Because our problem is, one of our problems is, our, ba our, our friends at DEC restrict the types of chemicals we can use so that they don't get into the groundwater, which of course is concerned to all of us. But Long Island's water table, our groundwater is only seven feet below the ground so that the chemicals that we are permitted to use must disintegrate, go away very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, the chemical companies are still making the chemicals and they're selling them to Mexico, who is using them, and then you're going to the supermarket and eating that food. So that there's more than one reason to support farmers markets, is for your health as well as your palate. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure in different regions too, that's, an, that's something that we're thinking about. And that's a, the story of water runoff is one that I think is really interesting, especially by these waterways. So is that something um, that you have experienced in fishing and runoff and how, how does, uh, basically how does what I do impact what kind of fish you get? Um, well, we did have a big problem uh, with the whole lobster industry in Long Island Sound some years ago. They started spraying for West Nile virus in from Brooklyn mm -hmm. all the way to the East End. Now all that, a lot of that pesticide ran into the water. That particular summer was a very warm summer. The water temperatures ver were very warm. Hmm. A storm came along, mixed everything up, and all the lobsters died. And to this day, there's hardly any left. And from what I understand, I don't think, bet between just the warming temperatures in general, um, they've not been able to reestablish themselves. Hmm. So I think we're finished for lobsters in Long Island Sound. There's a very few left, but they're not doing well. Hmm, that's um, interesting. And that was uh, due to the malathion that was sprayed, hmm. plus the temperature change. And the te that's yeah. interesting. So a lot of environmental shifts impacting what you're experiencing mm -hmm. and what you're doing every day. Did you mm -hmm. have something to add, Diana? Yes, um, farmers <laughs> take some blame for using nitrates in their fertilizer, and the amounts that we use are minuscule. However, the fertilizer that people put on their lawns and as ho housing developments crawl out Long Island, that, that it puts gobs of nitrates into the soil and that washes into the mm -hmm. waters and that kills Stephanie's fish, as well as gets into the groundwater and makes it not potable for humans or vegetables. And that's an interesting Long Island story too, as it was, an, it's kind of moving from this agrarian, and it has been for, hundred something years, moving from an, a, a farming agriculture to a lot of um, dense housing situations. So is there a, um, what is the one piece of advice, and anyone can jump in here, that you would give people on what they could do to keep Long Island Sound healthy? Don't water your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got stop, practical advice, stop watering your lawn. <laughs> I would say stop using all those pesticides on the lawn. On your lawn? Because it just runs right into the That's water and the so, bay and the sound. So Smithsonian Gardens has actually done um, a lot of research and work and is doing some really cutting edge things on water runoff and you should all speak with them at their table later tonight. And I am, I know we want, all want to get back to dessert, which I hear is coming. So I'm going to just turn it over to questions to see if anyone has a few questions. And we have microphones in the audience. Um, we have a question over here over here, <laughs> or whoever's closer. There's two microphones. We have a question right in the front. Brett, can you give him a microphone right in the front there? Thank you. <laughs> Testing. We're good. Okay, the uh, point about uh, trading with the enemy. I mean, all the Yankees, which I think included the Long Islanders, Did. were against the War of 1812 because it cut their trade. Cut, so yeah. you guys weren't alone. I exactly. mean, the Southerners felt differently. Yeah, but I the mean, the, 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 southerner, the Southerners and the Westerners were the Warhawks. And you guys, uh, I think there was a Hartford Convention or something that uh, uh, almost declared independence from the rest of the United States. <laughs> There's so, a long tradition in, in the U.S. history of trading with the enemy. I mean, it goes, you know, back to the Revolution, and uh, that's, you know, that's, that's American. Very American. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone else have a question for the panel? And yes, do you, do you want to do? 
Yeah, you, meant, you mentioned the spraying for the West Nile. I, I'm an infectious disease specialist, so I would ask you, I think it's terrible what happened. I, I wasn't aware of that, but what would be the alternative to spraying for West Nile? Because a lot of people yeah. died from that. Or yeah. we're, we're seriously I, I don't uh, know. disabled. That's a great question. I mean, as the <laughs> infectious disease specialist, what, what do you have a suggestion? As far as environmentally, no. I know that what you have to do. What, what you have to do is spray for mosquitoes, and you have to mm -hmm. avoid standing water and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. that's what public health officials have to do. So, I mean, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a real uh, conflict. Yeah, it's difficult. I remember they. They did, tried to do a lot of public education with the standing water, mm -hmm. and they told people the times they would be spraying so they could close their windows and things like that. Um, but, you know, all these lobster guys, they were doing well. They, the whole industry was gone. So, it's yeah, I... Side effect of that, but yeah, <laughs> I know, but people did die from it, too. So yeah, it's a really, I really don't complex know what issue. the solution is. Mm -hmm. Did you we, want to add something to you, We used to burn the Phragmites, which was home for for mosquitoes and ticks, and it was a controlled burn every year, and the, the DEC put a stop to it, so now we have ticks. Hmm. I didn't know That's that. That's very interesting. And did you have a question to you in the front? Uh, I was curious, Cindy, if you could talk about what we would have seen in a public marketplace in New York City around the War of 1812, right before the War of 1812, and also what products Long Islanders might have been taking back to Long Island after visiting the city mm -hmm. from abroad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the, the seasonality that's coming up here was very evident, of course, in uh, the markets in the 19th century. Um, they didn't need to be reminded <laughs> or educated about seasonality. There was no refrigeration. There was no... Um, uh, Th there was not reliable enough transportation to allow things to get to market from far away before spoiling. So uh, there was no such thing as, you know, strawberries in, in, in September. Um, and so the, what was in the market depended just like what uh, Stephanie and Diana were talking about on what was being grown in the fields. Um, but it, so it would, you know, you would have, but you would have a big range around the year. So the summer obviously was the most uh, abundant and diverse uh, period. Um, so you would have strawberries in June, and um, uh, John Pintard, who wrote a, a pretty famous diary in New York City in the early 19th century, and he was a real foodie, uh, he recorded all the stuff that came into the market. So he would be very excited when the peas showed up in the spring, um, you know, because this was the beginning of that, of that season. And, you know, carrots and uh, root vegetables a little bit later, lots of apples and lots of different kinds. And then, um, and you mentioned wild game too. Wild game, yeah, mm -hmm. the wild game. And after the Erie Canal opens, I mean, that changes everything. So wild game is coming from as far west as Wisconsin. Um, you had fish coming from uh, from from Long Island, of course, um, but also from New England. Um, and again, with with new te with technological change, that the the kinds of fish that would come in um, would. Uh, would expand. And what Stephanie said, you know, really rung in my ear also that um, they were talking about overfishing and pollution affecting the, the, uh, the availability of certain items even as early as the first half hmm. of the 19th century. Oysters is a good example. I mean, I can't yeah, let, we haven't even we can't exactly, nobody said oysters, we can't, oysters. We can't <laughs> end without mentioning oysters. <laughs> Um, and uh, the oysters were overfished, and in, as they're, they're searching for a commercial um, alternative to uh, naturally grown oysters, to cultivated oysters, in the 1820s. Hmm. So already, oh, that's, wow. you know, yes, that's starting there. Um, in Long Island, Staten Island, you know, those are big um, oystering areas. Huh. So and I, great. And Brett, I think Brett had one more question that he was pointing to in the back. Hi. Um, I know that there's a vibrant um, farming industry and a winery industry over in Long Island now, and I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between the farming and the wines and, uh, and when that kind of started coming about and what that tradition is. So when we moved wines, wineries. When did they start? Um, <laughs> 70s. Well, Paul can answer that, actually. <laughs> I think Louisa Hargraves came in the, in the 70s, mm -hmm. but there are now 30 wineries, and it's a wonderful use of the soil, and we're very happy to have them there. It's a big Rather deal. Than lawns. It's a big. Uh, I mean, <laughs> tourists, uh, weekenders come. People come for the day, the weekend, the week. Mm -hmm. um, it's fun to go around to all the wineries. They also stop at all the farm stands, 
and I must and say, they sell them in Brooklyn. The Long What's Island that? Farms. They, you know, oh, they I do mean, the sell Long the Long Island, Island wines yeah, at the, the Long Island farmers markets. So there's a symbiotic the relationship mm-hmm. there between the wineries and the farmers markets that are on Long Island, and plus also, what people are getting in cities. The oysters have become farmed oysters, cultivated mm-hmm. oysters have become a big thing. I think there are 60 permits for people doing wow. that now, and you can find some of them at the farm stands where we are, mm-hmm. and in many of the local restaurants. Mm-hmm. Interesting. We mm-hmm. also have a large lavender farm now in East Marion, New York, and they did a very smart marketing uh, project this spring. They advertised in the Asian community on the other end of Long Island, and the Asians use lavender for s- smoking and scourging evil spirits out of their homes. We couldn't get through the one road that we have out there because there were thousands of cars for four weekends in a row mm-hmm. buying lavender. So I'm sure they had a good year. <laughs> so I, we have one, I think we have time for one more okay. question, and then we'll turn it. Turn it Stephanie. Over to the garden. Stephanie, as a native of New York and grown up on Long Island, I've never had porgy. How do you prepare it? What? You've never I had know. porgy? <laughs> How do you um, prepare great it? Question. Well, that's a really plentiful fish. Um, it's a little bony. Um, you can eat them whole. You can throw them on the grill. You can roast them in the oven. We sell the filet as well. They're small, good to steam or saute. Um, and the other way, if you don't want to deal with the scales, you can bake it in a salt crust, and that's very delicious and easy. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> All right. So thank you. A huge thank you to our panelists. This has been very interesting. Thank you. Clearly lots of connections there between what was happening in the past, what's happening today, and obviously a lot of really complicated issues that we're still thinking about and still working with today. So everyone is probably ready for the exciting dessert that I hear we're going to get as well that involves um, ice cream that was made by our chef just this morning. So we're going to um, go back out into the garden. Cindy will be signing copies of her book. We also have uh, folks here tonight from Westford Hills Fruit Distillery Distillers that uh, is in Southern Connecticut, so also Long Island Sound. We focused our discussion up here a lot on the New York side of Long Island Sound. There's a whole other multiple state side of the water. Um, we also have Amagansett Sea Salt here, who makes sea salt. On, they're on the southern coast of Long Island, and they'll be doing some demonstrations of sea salt making. So if you haven't seen that, that's great. We have folks from the EPA's Long Island Sound Study, so people who are researching year-round on what is happening in Long Island Sound. We have our own staff from the American History Museum talking about the um, slave ship trade in the, around the early 19th century involving some of the research we're doing here. And of course, we have our, all of the staff from Smithsonian Gardens will be here to answer all of your questions. So please stop and ask anyone, hey, what is this? I've never seen this before. This looks delicious. They love, we all love talking about those topics. So next week, we hope to see you right back here where we'll be talking about um, cultural connections in the Chesapeake. And until then, please enjoy the gardens. And thank you all so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you.